All right, let's begin this morning with prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we begin our morning by being mindful of you so that we commit our time to you in the hope that in return you will grant us your spirit to be our teacher for the sessions that we have in Sunday school and then in the assembly of your people as we come to worship you. So be with us so that we might learn of you and be students of our Lord Jesus, disciples in the world, learning his will, learning to imitate him, being conformed to his image, and learning to do the things that are pleasing to you. We ask this through Christ. Amen. All right, when we were last together, I've been sort of rehearsing something that I've discussed frequently in the past. Under the category of land, as part of the nine, that over time, land underwent kind of a transfer so that we associate it almost exclusively with heaven, that is, that, that part of the creation that is above us, as the Bible describes it, but which is, in our imaginations anyway, seen as non-material and connected to that is our own self-evaluation that as human beings our essence is to be found in the non-material part of us and that depending on the tradition and the influence of philosophy that the material part of us is actually the sort of lower part of us, the less desirable part of us, that maybe it's even the part that once we are rid of it, we are finally free. And so even in our, the way we conduct our funeral services or converse about death and the Christian, we see a very positive development when human beings die because they've reached a place of freedom. Um, so this is something I've talked about many times in the past. And I think it's shifted our focus, that is collectively, away from what is one of the singular most important doctrines in the New Testament, which is the resurrection of the body. And so I was sort of riffing a little bit the last time we were together on all the things that make the human body undesirable um, and why in the history of the church, at least in the Western church, a, a very strict division grew that separated those of a higher spiritual life who dedicated themselves to suppressing the body and its desires, and a lower, more carnal spiritual life, which was uh, sub, I don't want to say sub-perfect, uh, sub-desirable, um, yet tolerable. Okay, so uh, that'd be a lot of you guys. You, you want to get married, you want to do what married people do because you really, you know, have these burning desires. So you have babies and all that goes along with babies. While the more elite among us step out of that, the worldly carnal desires and dedicate ourselves to spiritual pursuits, say, in the monastic life. Okay, so this is the outworking of an under lying philosophy that says uh, flesh is inferior, spirit is superior, and for the time being they may have to coexist together, 
but we want to be done with the, the body and experience the, the fuller freedom that goes along with the spirit. Okay, it's funny, his, in cultural terms, there's been uh, a flip of that. So now the body is seen as all that there is. And the spiritual part of us, if there is such a thing, um, is whatever you want to do with it, whatever makes you feel good, or whatever you can invest in for your self-improvement. But the body is where all the action is. In fact, there is no soul or animating force. It's just what we are. In crude terms, we are bags of meat, right? Have you ever heard that expression? John, you look like you've heard it. Yeah, that's what we are. Um, very impressive meat, I might add. Yet, nevertheless, that's what we are. And you can see that philosophy in outworking in, say, euthanasia movements or uh, some dimensions of PETA and other philosophies where there's really no significant difference between us and what we used to call the lower forms of animal life. Okay, So we are basically sophisticated barnyard animals. We all do the same thing. Um, only for us, we put the veneer of society and of things like romance and love and privacy and all of those things. But nevertheless, in the essence, there's no big difference between us and the lower functioning animals. Okay, anything about that? Because this is where I'm going to start moving into the affirmation of the land, the material land, as very much a part of God's kingdom that continues right on into Romans through Revelation as we would have expected if we are reading the biblical story from left to right. I have a quick question. So you were saying before the body was looked at as base and the spiritual was elevated. Are you talking about culturally? I, when it, there I'm talking about religiously, right, but, then, but religious... No, no, no. Religion and culture were two sides of the same coin. I'm thinking of the development in Catholic tradition and so forth. Okay, so you're talking about present day in the Catholic tradition? That still exists, but now the culture has gone in the opposite direction, probably largely as a result of the triumph of scientism and Darwinism. So the culture wasn't like that back earlier? Okay. No. That's what I to know. Nope. Okay. So, Peter, John, and Paul were all devout Jews who saw in Jesus' death and resurrection the completion of that Old Testament trajectory of eschatology in general and God's kingdom in particular. Okay, Everything that we've looked at in Isaiah from 2014 on, finds its completion in the events of Jesus' death and resurrection. And so, on the other side of the resurrection, if the trajectory were to continue, we would expect to find land, right? Some type, type of material land for the citizens of God's kingdom to live in. So there's a, a bit of a tension here between the tradition and the trajectory. If we read right to left, working backward, we come up with a different conclusion. Okay? So what we want to do is we want to figure out how did this Old Testament trajectory work itself out in history in a way that is consistent with both the original creation and bodily resurrection. See, bodily resurrection is God's answer to the curse on Adam and Eve. 
It would be an incomplete salvation if the end of the story showed a separation between body and spirit, or even elevating the spirit as superior and the body as inferior. That's all the result of sin and death. Okay? So, those resurrected bodies, consistent with the original creation, must have a place to live and call home. And that place, place is the kingdom of God's realm, the new earth. Where is this place? Well, in some sense, it is the earth, right? Paul seems to say that clearly enough. Romans 4.13, For the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be heir of the world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. And so in Paul's mind, there is a fulfillment of the promise made to Abraham where he sees the land of Canaan as a type. But it's not a type necessarily of the heavenly world above. It is a type of the entire earth. So Abraham and his seed are to be heir of the world. And so 2 Peter 3.13, But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. So, if I were arguing against me at this point, I would point out that this doesn't get at the category place in the nine in the same way as we've seen the other categories, at least so far, because now it seems to be entirely future. But Jesus, as we've seen, is prophet, priest, and king now in the already. And the apostles teach that believers are priests now, that we participate in Jesus' reign now, so Putting this off to the future isn't satisfying, okay? So let me state my point up front. The land, as distinguished from the heavenly realm, it exists along with the prophet, priest, and king. It exists now and is referred to as the inheritance. Okay, I'll say that again. The land, distinguished from the heavenly realm, exists right now along with the prophet, priest, and king. And in the New Testament, it is referred to as the inheritance. Okay, now that's, that's, a, that's a lot. That's kind of a stuffed phrase. Do I need to unpack that before we move on? Obviously, I'm going to work it out, but if it made no sense to you whatsoever, I don't want to move forward yet. I just phrase it in my own words to make sure I understand. So, essentially, part of our inheritance with the saints is the fact that we will be living on the earth and that this land is part of that inheritance. So is that yes, that's true. And what I want to say is, just to keep it consistent with the prophet, priest, and king, that though, it, though in our experience of it, there is this clear future dimension, nevertheless, it exists in the present. Okay? So, for us, future suggests not yet, in terms of non-existence. But in the already not yet, the line is drawn differently. It exists, but it's not experienced. You see the difference? So you're saying this land exists, but it's not experienced. In the sense that we will experience when the not yet part right. comes to an end. So we're here, but we're not experiencing the sinless perfection of Christ 
being present, Satan overthrown, and all that. Right. But that's not to say it doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. Okay? This land is your land. Mm -hmm. This land is my land. Mm -hmm. Okay? So listen to Paul in light of what I just said. Though the text doesn't have the word inheritance in it, I think it gives us a great deal of insight into how he thinks about the created order. 2 Corinthians 4, 17 through 18. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. Now, for the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Now that suggests to me that the things that are unseen are in fact realities, yet they remain invisible to us in the present state of affairs, right? So there's, the, there's where the already not yet comes in. It doesn't mean the things that are unseen do not exist, but rather they exist yet remain invisible to us, okay? So what Paul is saying, in effect, is there is much more going on in God's created order than meets the eye. And, you know, what he is saying here, and this is how the New International Revised Version puts it, we look at what we can't see. That's a, that's a nice way to phrase it. We are looking at what we can't see, which doesn't make any sense except in the way Paul understands God's created order. He is not bound to strict enlightenment categories where one must be able to empirically test and observe every scientific proposition. He is dealing with God's creation. And as he says in many places, including Colossians, that the Lord Jesus Christ created both the visible and the invisible worlds. For him, those two things coexist very naturally in the way he views the world through God's word. Where for us, the invisible doesn't exist until we can verify it through some type of process of testing. So Paul says, we look at what we can't see which makes sense only to Christians. And I would say this is one of the many faults in the Christian tradition, that it spends most of its time looking at what it can see and then reacting to it, which throws off the whole balance, at least as Paul would understand it. So we look at what we see and then say, well, what does God have to say about this? We don't spend very much time at all looking at what we can't see. And Paul would say, we're to conform ourselves to what we can't see. As if those things actually exist, right? So, seeing that Christians, both Jews and Gentiles, who are united to Christ, are the Israel, at God, uh, the Israel of God, it follows that they must have a homeland a place where they and God may dwell together in security. And that means in the body. Okay, now we're going to start doing a little bit of work in a passage that I think supports this. But again, I'll just stop to make sure we're all kind of together on this. What did you say? Where? <clears throat> Seeing that Christians by which I mean Jews and Gentiles united to Christ, are the Israel of God, it follows that they must have a homeland, a place where they and God may dwell together in security. Okay. 
That's a big deal in the, in the Old and New Testaments. To dwell with God securely, without fear of our enemies. Okay. Such a place exists, but it is not found under the name Israel, but under the word inheritance. So now I have a, you can open your Bibles to this because it's a little bit of a longer reading, but keeping the entire passage together, I think, is important. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 through 12. You'll see why in a moment it's important to keep the entire passage together. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father and the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. There's a little bit of that same, we look at what we can't see. Um, Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Concerning this salvation, the prophets, who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours, searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you, in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, there are other inheritance passages in the New Testament, mostly in Paul, though there is one in Hebrews, and we will look at those further on. But this one in Peter, in its context, is especially useful to us because it serves the purpose of this study by illustrating why the already not yet is so fundamental, so basic such an organizing principle of New Testament theology at every level, including, may I add, the how shall we then live level, which people place a premium on. One of my critiques of popular Christianity is it goes directly to the how shall we then live category without doing the, the basic structural foundational work of the already not yet. 
So the how then shall we live category is, it's like a, a volleyball. It's bounced all around the Christian church with competing teams who want more of this, more of that, less of this, less of that. Different tradition, but you have to do the work of the already not yet before you can even address the issue of now what? How should we live? And we find that structure in Paul's letters, right? The indicative comes before the imperative. The statements that are true come before the commands to obey. So Paul doesn't start typically with commands to obey. He starts by laying once again a foundation of what God has done for his people in Christ. And then he comes to a point in the letter where he says, Therefore, do this, be this, act this way. So, this passage in 1 Peter is more than a verse with the word inheritance in it. In a short space, it works out what the inheritance concept means for the church's self-understanding in the world. So, the word inheritance here represents something. It's a concept and Peter is building on that. He does through the entire letter, actually. Um, what the concept means for the church's self-understanding in the world. And while the word inheritance does not appear until chapter 1, verse 4, Peter's inheritance theology shows up at the very start of the letter in the salutation. Peter... An apostle of Jesus Christ to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion. Elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. There are three, count them, three, three significant theological words in a row here. Elect, exile, we'll get to that word, that might not be the best way to put it, and diaspora or dispersion. The first and the third words, elect and dispersion, are clearly Israel-connected words, right? So you know how I think about many words in the New Testament? When we see them in the New Testament, they come to us predefined. Where are they defined for us? In the Old Testament. In the Old Testament. That's, that's the only answer that I ever want. So they developed conceptually for us in the Greek Old Testament so that once we arrive in the New Testament, they already are kind of packed with meaning. Their meaning isn't primarily, I won't say primarily, their meaning isn't exclusively determined by the dictionary. It's also determined by how the people of God use the word in redemptive history. Elect being perhaps the most obvious one, right? Who's the elect people in the Old Testament? Israel, right? So this isn't some type of abstract concept of election. It's something that's rooted and grounded in God's dealings with the Israel of the Old Covenant in the past. They were the elect people. The word diaspora comes from the Septuagint, and it's a word that referred to, quote, this is from a... Uh, this is from a dictionary, Israel among the Gentiles. This is a post-exilic word, right? Have you ever heard, we still use the word diaspora today. Anyone ever heard the word? Right? Sure. What do we mean by it? People that, are, that have a common identity that are scattered. And when it's capitalized, it means Jews. The diaspora are the Jewish people living among the Gentiles. Okay, so elect diaspora, 
elect diaspora, two Israel words. The word comes from diaspero, to scatter abroad, throw about, to be scattered abroad. And here's a particularly relevant example from the Psalms of Solomon. How many of you regularly read the Psalms of Solomon? You don't, because it's not in the Bible, but it is in the Septuagint. And the, and the psalmist, the psalmist, the psalmist, writes, When Israel was deported into exile to a foreign country, when they turned away from the Lord who had redeemed them, they were thrown away from the inheritance which the Lord had given them. They were thrown away from the inheritance which the Lord had given them. The dispersion of Israel was among every nation according to the saying of God, so that your righteousness might be proved right, O God, in our lawlessness. For you are a righteous judge over all the peoples of the earth. Isn't that amazing? This is a pre-New Testament witness to Jewish belief. It's not canonical, but it joins together the concept of the people of God in the dispersion, and the dispersion means they are away from the inheritance. It's our word, okay? So, there's the word. That word which the ESV translates as exile, carries a lot of weight. And this comes from one of the Greek lexicons. It pertains to staying for a while in a strange or foreign place, sojourning, residing temporarily. In our literature, uh, when it's used substantively, it means the stranger the sojourner, the resident alien of Christians who are not at home in this world. The author of 1 Peter makes an intimate connection between the status of the addressees as virtual visitors in the world because of their special relation to God through Jesus Christ and their moral responsibility. That's what I wanted to stress just a moment ago that when we're talking about our self-identity in the world, it includes the category of how shall we then live? So it's, this is not some detached esoteric thing that doesn't have much to do with real everyday Christianity. Peter would say, are you crazy? It has everything to do with real down-to-earth day-to-day Christianity. How can you understand your Christianity if you don't understand who you are? Right? Well, I'm a Baptist. Peter would say, I don't care if you're a Baptist. You're wrong, but I don't care about that right now. If you don't understand that you are a resident alien, then you don't understand who you are in the world, and therefore what your responsibilities to your fellow believers and to the world at large should be. So it's essential. It's not something that people who sit in theological ivory towers just like to bat about like ping pong games and discuss. It has everything to do with in the trenches Christianity. And if you read 1 Peter, that's what you will find. So this is Christian living, Christian praxis. Now it's a tricky word which is shown by the various choices that the English versions make. Uh, King James translates the word strangers. I don't like that word. I don't think it's the right word. The New American Standard translates it as those who reside as aliens. I like that better. In fact, I like that a little better than exile because exile is almost exclusively connected with punishment. So, this idea of residing as aliens, the New English translation has those, now this is one, two, three, four words to translate basically one word, those temporarily residing abroad. 
Okay? So, if you've been at P Parkwoods for any length of time, you won't be surprised to learn that this word and words that are related to it have deep ties to the Old Testament, especially to the period of the patriarchs. This is another thing that Dr. Klein put me on to, that our life as the people of God bears a closer resemblance to the patriarchs, really, than it does to national Israel as a theocracy. We are more like the patriarchs. We are living as resident exiles in a land that will belong to us, but right now we have to pay for it if we want it, just like Abraham did when he bought a grave for Sarah. Okay? He's going to own all this land. God gave it to him, but when Sarah dies, he says, look, what's it going to cost me? I'm going to buy this piece of land that God has promised to give me that I've all measured out already with these altars and said, yes, this is mine. I'm trusting God for it. Anyway, what do you want for it? Right? Right. Thanks, Nate. Say amen. Amen. That's right. So, any questions? I'm moving along rapidly, and I wonder if sometimes I'm making sense. So, if Peter addresses the elect exiles of the dispersion, then it follows, I think, that they must have a homeland. Mm. And sure enough, they do. Mm. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, and to an inheritance. Actually, the same word that's used in that Psalm of Solomon. We have been born again to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. Now get this. Kept in heaven for you. Kept in heaven for you. In other words, it's not identical to the heavenly realm. That's where this inheritance is kept. Now, the word living here, living hope, conveys the quality of spiritual, that is, what belongs to the Holy Spirit. It doesn't, it's not over and against dead, living versus dead. It's spiritual versus temporal and provisional. So the word spiritual means what is true and lasting as opposed to what is temporal and passing. Hope, of course, conveys a certainty about the, the future based on what has occurred already in the past. All right? I've done this kind of work elsewhere. If you want to look at word studies on the word living, I, in the book of Hebrews, in John's Gospel, Right? Living water, it's not opposed to dead water. It's the water that gives the life of the Spirit. Right? Um, God is looking for those who will worship Him in spirit and in truth. It doesn't mean it's not over and against Episcopalians who just go through the motions. It's, the, it's over and against understanding the historic worship of Israel in the land. So spirit and truth means it doesn't matter which mountain we go to anymore because now we are going to worship in the Holy Spirit according to the true forms that Israel under the law simply anticipated and were types of. You start talking like that and everyone goes, ah. 
but it's so important. An old friend of mine from long, long ago posted something about spirit and truth. Um, you know, and of course, that's, a, that's like a license to do whatever you want in worship, right? Whatever feels spontaneous and emotional. So I, uh, I sent her a copy of my sermon on that passage, and she must have, if she stayed awake through it, I'd be surprised. But I went through all the different options of what spirit and truth have been understood to mean, and then I demonstrated what it does mean, and she never got really back to me about that. So, all right, but the word inheritance is the key here. This word, and what we call its cognates, that is words that are related to it, right? So, inheritance, heir, inherit, those are all cognate words, they're all related in one uh, word family, if you will. That word appears in the Septuagint, the Old Testament in Greek, and it's used to refer to what? Old Testament. <laughs> well, it's used in the Old Testament, so we skip that part, and it refers to which land? Canaan. Canaan. Canaan as understood as the object of God's promise, right? This isn't like once or twice. This becomes the, 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 the speech of Israel. So it's used to refer to the land of Israel the on-the-map geographic space that the people of God lived in. Just a couple of examples, and I've, in other Sunday schools, I've put a lot of examples. These are representative. Mm -hmm. Yahweh spoke to Moses saying, this is Numbers 34, command the people of Israel and say to them, when you enter the land of Canaan, this is the land that shall fall to you for an inheritance. This is an inheritance for you. The land of Canaan, as defined by its borders, your south, shi south, shi <laughs> your south side shall be from the wilderness of Zin alongside Edom, and your southern bo border shall run from the end of the Salt Sea on the east. And this is then followed by nine more verses in Numbers 34, devoted to defining more precisely Israel's borders. Now that seems to us boring. How many of you have ever taken out your, your Bible maps and went verse by verse through Numbers 34 and compared it to that map, you know, Israel at the time of the conquest? I'll do that again. You don't do that, right? Yet to them, this is a defining moment. Literally, it's defining the extent of what God is giving to them as a people. So it's no small thing, though for us, because we're so spiritual, we don't care about things like boundaries and land anymore, unless it's the United States. Then we care. Deuteronomy 12, 8 through 12, you shall not do according to all that we are doing here today, everyone doing whatever is right in his own eyes, for you have not as yet come to the rest and to the inheritance that Yahweh your God is giving you. We're on the other side of the Jordan, so the inheritance is just right over there a little bit to the west. But when you go over the Jordan and live in the land that Yahweh your God is giving you, to inherit, and when he gives you rest from all your enemies around so that you live in safety, then to the place that Yahweh your God will choose to make his name dwell there, there you shall bring all that I command you, your burnt offerings and your sacrifices, your tithes, and the contribution that you present, and all your finest vow offerings that you vow to Yahweh. And you shall rejoice before Yahweh your God, you and your sons and your daughters, your male servants and your female servants, and the Levite that is within your towns, since he has no portion or inheritance with you. Okay. 
So that's just, again, illustrative that the language of inheritance in the Old Testament was understood not primarily as what the deceased parents pass on to their children, but as the land that God gave to the people of Israel. So an inheritance that is imperishable and undefiled is to be understood over and against an inheritance that perished and was defiled. Does this make sense? So you read 1 Peter 1 in your devotions and you think, oh, he's talking about heaven. How nice. Oh, no. Isn't it? But he's talking about much more than that. This is probably a good place to stop. So I have a question. Speaking of heaven, this is what I get confused about. Because there's an, what is heaven? Because here it says it's kept in heaven, right? Right. Um, so what does heaven mean in that context? Well, what is heaven in the Bible? It's... It's the place where God dwells. That's exactly right. That's the place where God dwells in the created order, right? Heaven is not an eternal pre-existing realm and the earth something that came into being. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, that could possibly mean he created the land and the sky, but as the story unfolds, the heavenly realm is where God lives, and the earthly realm is where humans live. And then the humans are his image bearers in the earthly realm, representing God to the created order. So creation is both the heavens and the earth, right? And if you remember from the Genesis sermons, the cre Once Adam rebelled against God, the, the normal, for lack of a better word, intercourse between the two realms was broken so that the heavenly realm and the earthly realm were now at odds with one another. So the story of Babel and the tower is what? It's an effort for humans to storm the heavenly realm. And God obviously frustrates that plan because it, it follows, you know, the cutting Adam off from Eden. So here they are trying to broach the walls of heaven. And then Babel is answered where? In the story. Where? No, no, not yet. Acts 2? Not yet. See, everyone goes to Acts 2. Which is fine. I think Acts 2 is the final or the ultimate uh, recovery of the Babel incident. But there's something that's much plainer in the story itself that comes not long after the Babel incident. They're dispersed. The promise to Abraham. Yes, specifically as Jacob receives the promise. Because what, what happens when Jacob, who is on the run from the land, right? What happens when he receives uh, the reaffirmation from God that he is the one who's receiving the promise? The stairway. The stairway. Mm -hmm. God comes down to him. So humans storming the heavenly realm will be frustrated. This is the principle of grace. God will now determine reconciliation but he will reconcile not just humans to himself, but heaven and earth. Right? Go back and read Colossians 1. All of which will cover in God, heaven, and Armageddon. Yes. All, yeah. <laughs> George is putting in a plug for God, heaven, and Armageddon. The reading group that meets when, George? Tomorrow night. So be there or be square. This is, this is the theology. This is the grace principle at work. Now God takes the initiative. And of all people, Jacob, the thief, the liar, the rascal. Talk about grace, right? What distinguishes Jacob from Esau? He stole. God's 
God chose Jacob over Esau. That's all. All right. Let's let's call this a morning.